uh, at the outset, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and Dr. Tilak for giving a nice introduction. So this is a, a different system and my talk doesn't involve any skin involvement. This clinical scenario, every pediatrician will come across either in your clinic or in your uh, hospitals or in the emergency rooms. 90% of these lesions, the etiology is medical. But various studies say there is 8 to 10% of the conditions where, situations where there is an underlying surgical cause for these distress cases. So our job is to pick up the clinical signs or clinical picture where we can diagnose these uh, surgical conditions a bit early so that we can have a good result and we can reduce the mortality and morbidity. So anything which compresses or compromises the respiratory system can produce the respiratory distress. Starting from the nasal cavity, oral cavity lesions, the cervical lesions, thoracic lesions and abdominal conditions, innumerable conditions of surgical importance can produce a respiratory distress. So here are some of the abdominal conditions, a massive distension secondary to intestinal obstruction, a massive pneumoperitoneum, this is called a football sign, and a multicentric neuroblastoma. So these cases where there is a gross abdominal distension, it splints the diaphragm and produces the respiratory distress. So now we see some of the cases where can we pick up some clinical signs to diagnose them early. This is a newborn with a massive cystic hygroma. The diagnosis is written on the swelling itself. So here, we doesn't strain much. These are all external visible lesions where it is a straightforward 100% surgical condition. These lesions, we have to aspirate immediately to decompress and then after that, we have excised, and this is the picture at the time of discharge. You can see a long incision starting from the neck to the chest, and also another incision in the axilla. And these lesions are massive cystic hygromas. The clinical picture for this is a lobulated cystic lesion, mostly in the neck and in the axillary region. And if you put a light, they brilliantly tra transilluminate. If you can refresh your Bailey and Love, the knowledge about the cystic hygroma, they contain a clear lymphatic fluid. So brilliant transformation is a characteristic feature of cystic hygromas. These cystic hygromas can occur anywhere in the body. They are because of the sequestration of the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system is there throughout our body. So they can go to any massive sizes. They don't give respect to any other tissues. So the problem with the lymphatic cysts is their extension. We don't need any investigations except for to see the extent of these lesions. We have to investigate them with CT scan. This is an entirely a different situation where these are all external and we can see them. Now we are going to a different lesions where they are all concealed. It is our duty to pick them up early. So this is a newborn with a respiratory distress. This newborn is six, sorry, this is a six week old infant. The distress has started from third week onwards. First three weeks, the baby is normal. The distress started after third week. And this distress is associated with strider which is gradually increasing in intensity. So any child with distress and strider, we are supposed to do a bronchoscopy. This is a bronchoscopy in future. You can see what is happening there. The epiglottis is falling on the glottic area on each inspiration. What is the diagnosis? Inspiratory strider. This is a case of laryngomalacia. Laryngomalacia. With each inspiration, the epiglottis is changing its shape into omega shape. It is called omega shape. 90% of the laryngomalacia, that doesn't need any treatment. It starts at six weeks, peaks at six months, regresses by two years of 
age. But some of the laryngomalacias, where it is producing severe distress and there is a sleep apnea syndrome and chance of death, then we do a supraglottoplasty using a laser. This is a supraglottoplasty. You create a raw area at the base of the epiglottis so that epiglottis develops adhesions. It doesn't fall easily. And the procedure what we done before supraglottoplasty is cutting the airy epiglottic folds. See, there are three structures which hold the glottis. Anteriorly epiglottis, posteriorly arytenoid cartilages, and laterally airy epiglottic folds. If all the three are involved, it is called type 1 laryngomalacia. Here the airy epiglottic folds are large, the folds are short, and uh, arytenoid cartilages are big, and they pull the epiglottis, so epiglottis changes its shape, that is omega-shaped epiglottis, and it causes obstruction, that is type 1. Type 2, epiglottis is normal, but arytenoids and its mucosa is more, so they fall onto the glottic area. Type 3, only epiglottis is involved. It is long, flabby, and falling onto the glottis with each respiration. So, why this uh, first three weeks this child is normal? Any postgraduate, laryngomalacia, first three weeks, the child has no distress and it is starting from third week onwards. This is because in the first three weeks, the inspiratory pressures are not sufficient. So as the inspiratory pressures are increasing, then the distress starts with the strider. The another thing is, when the child is taking pressure with inspiration with pressure against the closed glottis, they develop a negative pressure and these, all these cases are associated with gastroesophageal reflux. Next, we come into the next case scenario. This is a three months baby, distress since birth, but the distress is increasing gradually. It's a progressive distress, so it is increasing day by day. So the basic investigation for any distress child is an X-ray chest. If you see the X-ray chest, there is a hyperinflation in the middle of the right hemithorax, in the right lung, the middle lobe, there is a hyperinflation. And there is a mild mediastinal shift, and there is a, you can see the compressed right upper lobe and right lower lobe also in this case. So this is the CT chest, which is showing hyperinflated middle lobe on the right side, with herniation of the lung, mediastinal shift. This is a different case, but of the same history and same etiology. So this distress is there since birth, but it is gradually increasing. If you see this pathology in this child is on the left side. There is a hyperinflation, herniation of the lung, and if you see the CT, there is a hyperinflation. This we have operated. This is a case of congenital lobar emphysema. In case of congenital lobar emphysema, once you open the chest, normally we have to deliver the lung lobe, but here it is under pressure, so it pops out on its own. It is a very flabby, light pink in color, and it's like a sponge, the lung in congenital lobar emphysema. So the, this is a su superior pulmonary vein. We are left side superior pulmonary vein. We are ligating before we do the lobectomy. This is the first case, what I have shown you. The right middle lobe congenital lobar emphysema. You can see a normal upper lobe and a normal lower lobe with a hyperinflated middle lobe. The pathology in this is, it is the air trapping syndrome. Air is going in, but it is not coming out. So that's why there is a progressive distress in this child. This is because of bronchial anatomy abnormality during the development and the treatment is lobectomy. You have to remove the lobe so that the other lobes will enlarge and they compress. It is actually a life-threatening condition, but it is potentially reversible. If you detect them early and surgically corrected early, it gives an excellent results. So it is an over-expansion causing compression of the other lobes. It commonly involves the left upper lobe and second commonest is the right middle lobe. Both the cases we have seen now. Now we go into the 
fourth case scenario this is a six months old infant the distress started from third month onwards there is a gradual increase in the intensity of the distress so you can see the sweats on his face so as a routine we did a chest x-ray here there is hyperinflation of the entire left lung in the previous case we have seen hyperinflation of one particular lobe right middle lobe and left upper lobe here the entire lung is hyperinflated so air is going in and it is not coming out so something is compressing the main bronchus left main bronchus so we'll see what it is so next we did a ct in ct you can see the right main bronchus is visible and left main bronchus some cyst is sitting there cystic structure you can see it is sitting over the left main bronchus causing ball wall mechanism so air is going and it is not coming out this is a mediastinal view this is a pulmonary view you can see the right main bronchus with air in it but the left main bronchus you can see like a half moon shape compressed by the cyst so we did a bronchoscopy before we go for a surgery so we wanted to see how the things are inside this is a bronchoscopy and the right bronchus is nicely seen with segmental bronchus that's the carina and you see the left bronchus something is uh, pushing the mucosa it is an extrinsic smooth cystic structure causing the obstruction to the left main bronchus only left main bronchus opening is visible but our scope we are not able to negotiate it so we did a thoracotomy and look at the carina level at the left main bronchus level. this is a mediastinal pleura we are opening and once we lift the left main bronchus that is the cyst which is coming into view so this is a full view of the cyst this is <coughs> a bronchogenic cyst bronchogenic cyst bronchogenic cysts are embryological abnormality when the foregut giving rise to the respiratory bud the respiratory diverticulum goes down grows down and then it divides into two dichotomy branches to give to the both the lungs but at that time if a small bit of it gets sequestrated that bit goes away from the tracheobronchial tree and give rise to cystic lesions so this is after the surgery the pressure over the left main bronchus is relieved so bronchogenic cysts they develop very close to the tracheobronchial tree and mostly near the carina either they can compress the carina or they can compress one of the main bronchus causing hyperinflation of the lobe and leading to the respiratory distress they are the most common primary cysts of the mediastinum they are mostly unilocular and they are very close to attach it to the tracheobronchial tree but they doesn't open if they open into the tracheobronchial see we can see nicely the air within that cyst next we go into the next lesion this is a six months baby presented with mild distress but repeated chest infections the distress is not much but the respiratory infection component is more so once an x-ray was taken what is there in the right hemithorax there is an echogenic mass with a lot of cystic spaces absence of the normal lung tissue there is a displacement of the mediastinum and because of the mass the di right diaphragm is displaced almost the right and left diaphragms are at the same level usually the right diaphragm is at a higher level then we did a ct which shows there is a multiple cystic lesions in the right lower lobe so this is a case of cystic adenomatoid malformation this is called ccam congenital cystic adenomatoid malformation here the pathology is in the terminal bronchiole during the development so that particular segment has turned into a non functional cyst rather than developing a normal alveoli so this non functional cystic lesion will act as a, a source for repeated infections so this is a cystic lesion with minimal functioning lung tissue intervening lung tissue so what is the clues in this 
here there is a initially the child is normal the clinical picture started after three months then distress is less but repeated chest infections and the x-ray like and subscribe eagle media works